Welcome to Retirement Lifestyles, where it's all about the health, wealth, and freedoms you need to live your dream retirement. I'm your host, Patrick McNally, and today it's all about the senses. In our health segment, Ken Wood from Upstate Hearing will bend our ears about hearing loss. What are the signs and what do you do if all of a sudden you're having trouble hearing your loved ones? In our lifestyle segment, we'll be getting our hands dirty with the Chico Garden Club to talk about gardening and how to adjust your planting for the drought. Plus, I'll teach you about the importance of controlling your personal debt. It's all right here on Retirement Lifestyles. Hi, and welcome to our health segment of Retirement Lifestyles. You know, one of the main things that affects a lot of retirees is hearing. And I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Ken Wood, from Upstate Hearing. Thank welcome you. to the show, Ken. Thank you, Patrick. You know, a lot of, you know, I also do financial planning and meet with a lot of clients. And a lot of times, I do notice that they are wearing hearing aids. So it's a, it's a big thing, especially, I think, going into retirement, that that's one of the key health concerns that a lot of people have. Do you find that when you're, is there a certain age or a certain time that people should be getting their hearing checked or what does that look like as far as from a health standpoint moving forward for people? Well, for most people, uh, we, tell, we tell people if you notice some hearing difficulty, if your family members notice hearing difficulty, because they're the ones that notice it first. Right. Right. It's not the person saying, huh, pardon, the ones that's repeating themselves. If they notice it, have your hearing checked or if you're on the age of 50. Get a hearing test done. Like anything with a physical, your hearing should be a part of that. Ken, how did you get involved with the, the hearing aid industry? Well, I was born with a hearing loss. Started wearing hearing aids when I was eight years old. That was a while ago. And uh, I never really planned on getting to this. I, I went and earned an AA degree in electronics. And at that time, the, the, the jobs were in the Bay Area. And so I went in to have my hearing aids worked on and said to the owner, my frustration with possibly moving to the Bay Area. And he said, well, you ever thought about the hearing aid industry? It had never crossed my mind till then. Okay. And so that's how I started. I started out doing repairs. He had a side company called Shelby Instruments, and we did repairs for offices across the country. And um, I sat at a, a desk looking through a magnified light, you know, right. with a small soldering iron and did that for a long time. We made custom hearing aids and ear molds and that kind of thing. And then it just went from there. Wow, wow. So you, you, it sounds like you were pretty instrumental, actually, in some of the technological advances yourself. I mean, you're working on these things. You're hands-on in the industry. What have you seen as far as changes from when you, as a young boy, had hearing aids put in to what we see now? Is it technology? Night and day it's, it's, yeah, it it's a high-tech industry. You know, the old-style hearing aids, we call them bananas. They were quite large. Okay. Now they're really small. You can't see them. Uh, of course, you know, they were analog back then. Now today, everything is 100% digital, of course. So you're wearing a computer, a very, very high-powered uh, computer in each year that does things that we didn't even imagine possible back, you know, in the 80s. So, so those have been some big changes. And the types of devices now, we fit what we call open ears, so they sound so much more natural. They don't, they don't plug your ear up. And that's probably been a huge factor in user satisfaction. Well, talking about user satisfaction, and you mentioned some of the big, the big hearing aids of the past. Do you think that was maybe a deterrent uh, for people? I don't want to say people are in denial when, right. when, they, when they, they have hearing loss, but do you think almost there's a, it was a deterrent because they were embarrassed maybe to have these things on their ears? I think there's always been a certain stigma yeah. out there, and I think um, you know, we're all a little bit vain, I suppose, and you know, people don't want something they can see, but... That's really not an issue anymore, but it used to be, yes, but not anymore. People, people can't see them. Yeah. You know, they just don't notice them anymore. They're really small, and so they're pretty discreet. And I think that that's, and you know, hearing devices are so much more common these days. You know, it's not like it used to be. And the big thing, I think, with retirees as well is it can be, a, it can be such a, a change to your lifestyle. You know, if, if you've gone so long and had hearing loss, and then once you get the hearing aids, is it almost like a new world opens up to you? Oh, sure. You know, when, 
when you lose your hearing, especially if you've had that loss for a little while, that's normal. That's what your brain considers normal. Okay. You know, we hear with our brain. And so when, you, when we bring those sounds back to you and you're not used to that, it's abnormal. But, you know, it takes a little time. So in our office, we demo everything and we let people try them for a couple of weeks. And so it gives them time to kind of acclimate. And it usually takes a little longer than that. But that first week or two, yeah, they're hearing all kinds of things. Well, I can only hearing. imagine how much satisfaction you have from seeing somebody who's maybe been without hearing for a long time to be able to help them. To open that world. I mean, I've seen, you know, even on some of these YouTube channels and stuff like that, yeah. when when children hear for the first time, yes. you know, and or and even some adults, you may, I'm sure you've probably seen some of these no, videos that just yeah. that just make get you so excited. I mean, that gets me excited yeah. when I see how happy people become because we take we take this stuff for granted. You know, we, we take the fact of, of of our hearing or even the ability to speak for granted, especially if you haven't lost something like that. So is that one of the main the reasons you love this business just because you have that passion to, to help people with their hearing? Oh, absolutely. It, it is remarkable to see people gain their hearing and connect with their family again. And they just open up. Yeah. Especially a lot of times I think people kind of pull back from different things uh, be, because it's difficult to follow the conversation, especially in a noisy okay. place. So when they are engaged again, it just keeps them, keeps them uh, active and keeps them connected to their family. And it, it is a very rewarding business. I love it. It's a lot of fun. One thing you just said right there, even if it gets noisy, like you walk into a restaurant, my mm -hmm. father wears hearing aids. And, and I do notice uh, he, he's got something where he can control the, the sound. Uh, is that part of the technology as well? Are they so sophisticated now that you could walk into a restaurant where it's just uncomfortably loud for somebody who doesn't wear hearing aids? It's got to be 10 times louder, right? Does that just reverberate in the ear and, and cause discomfort? No, technology today, they control that. It's not like that. It's not amplifying all that sound as much, you know, as it seemed like it would. It's, it's much better than it used to be. Okay. But noisy, difficult, noisy places are always more difficult. And, you know, I tell people um, one of the best things they can do besides wearing amplification is look at people. You know, make sure you can see the person you're talking to. If it's in the car, in a noisy place, at home, you know, because most people are much better at lip reading than they think, especially if they have a hearing loss. Okay. So, you know, it being able to become, focus almost on... It almost becomes second nature when yeah. you have a hearing loss to, to focus yes. more yeah, on it mouth. does. Yeah, and, I, and sometimes people say, well, I don't think I'm very good at that. Well, you're, you're better, better than you, you think. think. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, another thing, too, I, I, I used to notice when I was a kid, you know, going to a movie with my father. Mm -hmm. He would oftentimes, this is before he had hearing aids, he would oftentimes constantly ask my mother, what'd they say? Right. What did they say? Yeah. And now, you know, it's just a, a lifestyle change for him because he can go enjoy a lot of those things now that he can hear the conversation or watch the movie. I right. think that's really neat to be able to do that. Ken, what would you say, um, kind of going back to one of the original questions, at, at an appropriate age, is there a time when people should just consistently do Should we be checking our ears every year, even if we don't think there's a loss? You know, that's a good, good question. I think that... Uh... If, if your hearing's good, you know, like yourself, your hearing's good, you probably really don't need to have your hearing checked. But I tell people if they're at the age of 50 or older, have a hearing test done. Okay. Have it on record, just like a lot of things we start checking out as we get a little older, you know. It's just like having a physical. Make, make a hearing evaluation part of your physical. And, and then you, check it every couple of years. And you do this at Upstate Hearing right oh, here yes, ready, yes. correct? Yes. Do, you, do you have a website or a way that we can get in contact with you should we want to get a, a hearing check. Sure, you can go to upstatehearing.com or call our office at 243-7307. And we have four locations. Okay. Red Bluff, Susanville, Weaverville, and of course, Redding. Thank you so much for being on the show, Ken. I yep. appreciate you. It was great. Folks, highly encourage you, if you're even thinking about, you know, if you've been told by your family or you just feel like maybe there's a loss, contact Ken today and, and get your hearing check. It could change your life. Welcome to the Wealth Segment of Retirement Lifestyles. Today I'm going to talk about learning how to control your personal debt and accomplish your financial goals by making your personal debt work for you instead of against you. Let's face it, Americans are loaded with credit card debt. The average American household with at least one credit card has nearly $15,950 in credit card debt in 2012. That's according to creditcards.com. And the average interest rate? runs into the mid to high teens at any given time. Now, some debt is good. 
For example, borrowing for a home or college usually makes good sense. Just make sure you don't borrow more than you can afford to pay back and always shop around for the best rates. But other debt can be bad. You don't want to use a credit card to pay for things that you consume quickly, such as meals or vacations, if you can't afford to pay off your bill each month. Next, try to get a handle on your spending. Most people spend thousands of dollars without much thought to what they're buying. Write down everything you spend for a month. Cut back on things you don't need and start saving the money left over or use it to reduce your debt more quickly. I know, I know, you don't want to hear it, but nothing beats a good old fashioned budget. The next thing you want to do is build a cash cushion worth three to six months of your living expenses. And that's in case of an emergency. You need to expect the unexpected. If you don't have an emergency fund, a broken washing machine or a damaged car can seriously upset your cash flow. Here's another tip. Don't be so quick to pay down your mortgage. Mortgages tend to have lower interest rates than other debt and you can deduct the interest. You can't deduct credit card interest. Always remember that there's help available. If you've got more debt than you can manage, get help before the debt breaks your back. There are reputable debt counseling agencies that may be able to consolidate your debt and assist you in better managing your finances. But be careful. There's also a lot of disreputable agencies out there. So do your research before you pick one. Let's talk in more detail about good versus bad debt, because sometimes it does make sense to borrow, but a lot of times it doesn't. It's almost impossible to live debt free. Most of us can't pay cash for our houses or our kids' college educations, but too many of us let debt get out of hand. Ideally, experts say your total monthly long-term debt payments, including your mortgage and credit cards should not exceed 36% of your gross monthly income, which is also one of the metrics mortgage bankers consider when assessing the credit worthiness of a potential borrower. The challenge is learning how to judge which debt makes sense and which does not, and then wisely managing the money you do borrow. Good debt includes anything you need, but can't afford to pay for upfront without wiping out cash reserves or liquidating all of your investments. In cases where debt makes sense, only take loans for which you can afford the monthly payments. Bad debt includes debt you've taken on for things you don't need or can't afford, like that trip to Bora Bora or the old 80 inch flat screen you just had to have. The worst form of debt is credit card debt, since it usually carries the highest interest rates. Sometimes a decision to borrow doesn't hinge on how much cash you have, but on whether there are ways to make your money work harder for you. If interest rates are low, compare what you'll spend in interest on a loan versus what your money could earn if it were invested. If you think you can get a higher return from investing your cash than what you'll pay in interest on a loan, borrowing a small amount at low rates might make sense. Let's talk about some examples of good personal debt. Your home, education, and your old personal chariot qualify as good types of personal debt to have. Debt's not always bad. In fact, there are instances where the leveraging power of a loan actually helps put you in a better overall financial position. The chance that you can pay for a new house all in cash? Probably slim to none. What you need to do is carefully consider how much you can afford to put down and how much loan you can carry. Obviously, the more you put down, the less you'll owe and the less you'll pay in interest over time. What about paying for your kid's education? You know, allowing your kids to take loans makes far more sense than liquidating or borrowing against your retirement account. That's because your kids have plenty of financial sources to draw on for college, but no one is going to give you a scholarship for your retirement. What's more, a big 401k balance, they won't count against you if you apply for financial aid since retirement savings are not counted as available assets. It's also unwise to borrow against your home to cover tuition. If you run into financial difficulties down the road, well, you risk losing the house. The best bet is to save what you can for your kid's education without compromising your own financial health. Then let the kids borrow what you can't provide, especially if they're eligible for a government-backed loan. Such loans have guaranteed low rates, no interest payments are due until after graduation, and interest paid is usually tax deductible under certain circumstances. Now let's talk about figuring out the best way to finance your ride. 
Financing a car depends on a number of factors, like how long do you plan to keep it? How much cash do you have on hand for a down payment? Does it actually make sense to pay for a car in full? Well, that depends on what interest rates you can qualify for. If you can get a 0% interest rate, which is very possible today, you don't want to pay cash for a car. Keep the money in the bank. You'll make a little bit of interest while paying none to the car company. Most people, however, can't afford to put down 100% on a car, so the goal is to put down as much as possible without jeopardizing your other financial goals and emergency fund. Hopefully, you do get a decent interest rate, or you can, at least, you can at least refinance later on if you need to work on your credit score a little. Leasing a car might be a good bet if, you're, if the following applies. You want a new car, say, every three to four years. You want to avoid a down payment of 10 to 20 percent. And let's say you don't drive more than about 15,000 miles a year. That's usually what's allowable in most leases. And you keep your vehicle in a really good condition so that you can avoid that end of lease penalty. Learning how to control your personal debts can truly be life-changing. The goal is for you to control your money and not the other way around. Welcome to the lifestyle section of the show, and I'm super excited today to be visiting with Susie Gillum from the Chico Horticulture Society. How are you doing today, Susie? Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much you for also. being here. Thank you. I, I was really excited to talk about this piece of the show because obviously with the drought and everything going on, when we talk about watering our lawns or tending to our gardens and doing a lot of things that a lot of retirees in the North State love to do, right. it's got to be affecting a wide majority of people who are a part of the society. So I really want to touch on that. But first, give us a little bit of an introduction about how long the Horticultural Society has been around and how you got involved with that. Oh, sure. Um, actually, we call it Chico Hort, colloquially, so that, that'll make it easier to so say. So I don't have to be in the club to call it Chico Hort? No. I can do that? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll put you in the club right now. Perfect. <clears throat> no, uh, Chico Horticultural Society is one of the very first garden clubs in the state of California. It was founded in 1921 and was the first charter member of uh, National Garden Clubs in California. I became involved in Chico Hort because Mike's, my husband's grandmother was a member, um, and his mother, his aunt, two of his aunts. So it was kind of a family thing. Mike yeah. actually became involved when he was eight years old. When we returned to Chico in 1989, I was interested in becoming a flower show judge and a better designer. So I joined Chico Horticultural Society then, and I've been active ever since. That sounds like it would be a natural fit when you want to get involved in that kind of stuff. So judging, that sounds really interesting. Tell me, tell me about that. I'm a nationally accredited master to judge. I judge horticulture and design, often in fairs and in accredited flower shows. So I'm a little uneducated when it comes to the whole horticultural thing. When you say you judge horticulture, what... What actually are you judging? Flowers, obviously I picked up flowers, on that piece. Flowers, potted plants, okay. flower designs, anything that you can grow, vegetables, fruits, everything. Okay. If someone wants to be, become more involved uh, with Chico Hort, mm -hmm. um, how, how would they go about doing that? It's really easy. We have a, gar we have a garden website now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so all you have to do is Google, Google um, Chico Garden Club, and it'll come up the first one on the top. And uh, there's information there, the P.O. box number, a contact number. All you have to do is give us a call. It's a great, great way to not only learn about gardening and horticulture, how to do a flower design for your kitchen table or something, but the people that are involved are passionate about plants, yeah. their yards, about ecology, about saving water about everything there is to have to do with horticulture and botany. You'll learn so much, and they're fabulous people. That so just makes the experience so much more fun, right, when you can be a part of a group mm -hmm. where you've got relationship right. and, a, and a shared passion for exactly what you're doing. Now, do you have to be um, like a professional horticulturist or can just a novice like myself, I think you're probably picking up on that. I, I don't have a major green thumb, but I'm very interested in that. Do you, will you bring on younger members who maybe haven't had a background in this? And That's exactly what we want to okay. do. 
Exactly. In fact, what we do, one of the things we do in our club is we have a gardening program for the children, for the youth. And we um, give out scholarships and grants to the school that we're a nonprofit. So all of most all of our money goes into community projects and into our school grant process. And we're trying to encourage these children to find the 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 reward and the yeah. joy in planting a seed and seeing it grow or seeing a, a garden come into fruiting season and collect all their plants and make salsa. It, it's fabulous. And that's what we really enjoy doing the most. Well, I've got a That ten includes and eight adults. Okay. Okay. So it's not just for the kids, <laughs> too. I want to have kids. some fun. Yeah. But I do have a 10 and an 8-year-old, and we have tried, you know, to we try to we want to get them outside and get them mm -hmm. on their hands and knees mm -hmm. and getting into the soil. And they really get into it. They, they love, love it. it. Mm -hmm. And then just like you said, um, I haven't killed everything in our garden. Uh, a few things have worked. You should join our, you should join and us. Then, and then <laughs> everything will work. That's the best part. <laughs> but just seeing how much fun they have. And, yeah. and like you just said, when, yeah. when they, they see a seed that they've planted grow into something, that's a great thing that not only, um, as a parent, I can... I can have fun with and watching the kids, but grandparents can Very also much so. bring their grandkids into that as well, and Very maybe have something so. that they share along with that. A lot of our members tend to be older, um, okay. and that's partially because we usually meet during the day. That's just kind of a historical trend. Um, but since we're mostly older, we meet in the daytime, and that kind of makes it difficult for people who work full time. But we do have a lot of people who are joining, and this year we're going to try we're trying to get together a plan to have some evening meetings and that will enable some younger people to attend as well or to bring their children when they're in, not in school. So let me go back to that. So you've got the normal meetings. Now, is, are those more business type meetings or do you get together and talk about uh, new trends that are going on in ways that, that are changing in the, in the horticultural trends going on and, and throughout the world? Do you talk about that kind of stuff or is it also hands-on learning? Both, all, okay. all of that. All right. um, we usually have a short, in the day meeting, we have a short business meeting, and then we have a program every month. The programs vary anywhere from how to put in a drip system to everything you want to know about begonias, Perfect. how to propagate them, how to plant them, how to nurture them. The programs are vast. This last year, we really concentrating on, um, concentrated on um, gardening for the drought. Um, how do you decrease your watering and still have your plants survive, which is very difficult. Right. Minor suffering also. That's a big thing right now, the drought, since very you brought much. that up. Uh, what are you seeing and how much is, are, are people suffering with, when it comes to their gardening and, and all of their planting? I mean, I know I've seen my front yard yeah. going brown. Yeah. What, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing? Um, I think everybody um, here as well as in Chico area are suffering a lot. The, gar the gardens are really taking a toll. Okay. Um, mine is a very old established garden. It was planted in 1924 by Mike's grandmother. And the older plants are well established, but the rest of them, the newer ones, are getting a little bit more difficult to maintain. Okay. Yeah. And so with some of these meetings, are you able to give some tips and strategies on how you can continue to keep your garden healthy even through the drought? Not even, not just in the meetings. We do in the meetings, but we also give our, make ourselves available to people to just call okay. for, for advice. Can you give me one more time, give our audience, um, again, where they can reach you and get in contact if they want more information or to become a member? Sure. The Garden, uh, the garden Club's website is chicogardenclub.com. And that will get you to one of the members. Susie, thank you so much thank for you. coming on. Really appreciate My pleasure. you. Ladies and gentlemen, I high, highly encourage you to check out, become a member, of the, be, become the Chico Hort, become part of that group. I know you've got my attention there, Susie, and it's a lot of fun you can have, not only for yourself, um, but with the grandkids, with the kids, and just have a wonderful time being in the garden, especially if you already love doing that. But learning tips and strategies to make that grow, even through a drought, could be a great thing. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching our show this week. If you want more information about any of the guests or the topics we talked about, you can visit the Retirement Lifestyles page at kixie.org. We'll see you next week on Retirement Lifestyles, where it's all about having the health, wealth, and freedom you need to live your dream retirement.